Hi, folks. Denise Howell here. Larry Downs and Jeff Mann join me today to talk about great topics that happened this week, including the Viacom versus YouTube decision, Al Franken on privacy and antitrust, the mainstreaming of streaming and what that means for net neutrality, spectrum policy, and lots, lots more next on This Week in Law. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Law is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twill, This Week in Law with Denise Howell, episode 156, recorded April 6, 2012. Recipes for Mischief. This episode of This Week in Law is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All streamed directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash twit. Hi, folks. It's Denise Howell here, and you've tuned in for This Week in Law. We have an amazing couple of folks with us today. I'm so excited. Uh, Joining back on the show is Larry Downs from CNET and Forbes, and he's just a various uh, all-around smart guy. Um, So we've got Larry back on the show, and I'm thrilled. Hello, Larry. Denise, great to be back as always. Uh, Great to have you back. Uh, Much to discuss this week. Um, Joining us, too, from Lewis and Clark Law School and the International Institute of Law and Economics is Jeffrey Mann. Hello, Jeff. Hi, how are you? Great to be here. Always good to have have another opportunity to talk with my friend Larry. Yes, and great to meet you. Um, Lots going on. You guys have been busy uh, writing, commenting, uh, submitting things to Congress that they need to know about, uh, about various law and policy issues. But uh, probably the story of the week in technology Mm. law is the ruling out of the Second Circuit in the Viacom versus YouTube case, which is pretty universally being heralded as a win or at least a small win uh, for the Viacom side of the equation. What it means uh, is that the case will continue going on. Uh, the district court case had the case coming to an end. Uh, but no, the Second Circuit has decided that there is actually some room to talk about claims against YouTube, uh, both on the part of Viacom and on the part of some class action plaintiffs that were tossed out at the district court level. Um, so let's talk about this. It's, uh, it's certainly going to be a watershed decision for the DMCA because uh, Lewis Stanton's decision at the district court uh, very broadly interpreted the DMCA safe harbors and gave a good deal of protection to folks who stand in the position of YouTube in this case um, and said that uh, they have strong protections uh, against the infringements of users, even if they have some degree of knowledge that infringement on the site is taking place. I, I think it's that some degree of knowledge uh, part that's going to be interesting as we go back into this case and the case goes back to the district court for more findings uh, because the Second Circuit was not so sanguine um, and and thought that if things were terribly obvious, if there were brightly red waving red flags uh, for the hosting provider such as YouTube here, uh, then in fact the safe harbor was not going to be as expansive as the lower court had said. So Larry, let's start with you. Uh, What do you think about this decision and what's going to happen next? Well, it's an interesting decision, Denise. I, I think it's uh, it's definitely a win in some sense for Viacom, but it's not really much of a loss for YouTube. And I say that because of what's left of the case. Um, you should probably step back and say that the, the whole point of the DMCA safe harbor was to create a pretty open space in which services come along, posted some kind of user content, whether it's text or video, uh, and not put a sort of burden on the entrepreneur innovator to be monitoring or supervising or overseeing uh, all of that content. And it's obvious for things like YouTube, where there are literally millions of people uploading videos uh, all the time, that if there was a sort of ongoing monitoring requirement, 
those kinds of services wouldn't exist. And it's worth noting that most of the sort of successful user content driven things of the web two portion are things that started in the United States. And that's largely because of this safe harbor, which uh, we have and, and many other countries don't. So in the particular of the Second Circuit opinion, you know, they did, I think, uh, reiterate and reinforce a lot of what uh, the district court and some other circuits have held about this, which is that uh, most of that is still in place. The idea of the safe harbor is still there. Uh, in particular, the Second Circuit said, you know, don't think that sort of just generalized knowledge that infringing activities by users is enough to defeat the safe harbor. Survey data isn't enough. You really need to know specifically, and it's usually the responsibility of the owner of the copyright to make that knowledge known, but you really need to know specifically that uh, certain things are on there that are infringing. The only problem, I think, with the decision is uh, this use of the term willful blindness. Uh, this is a, a, a term that's sort of getting thrown around in, uh, in a lot of discussions about the safe harbor. And what the Second Circuit said was, you know, if uh, the operator of a service can be shown to have been willfully blind, that is sort of intentionally ignoring or not looking for evidence of specific infringement going on on the site, um, that uh, behavior might be enough to defeat the safe harbor. And what the case now does is sends it to take a closer look uh, at a very, very small subset of the uh, videos that, um, that uh, Viacom was complaining about, mostly from the early days of YouTube, to say, you know, did they, have, did they exhibit willful blindness in that very, very small subset of, uh, of videos uh, and, and everything else in the case is still gone. What do you think will be necessary uh, for Viacom to show that willful blindness was present? Well, it's a good question. I mean, you know, they did uncover uh, during discovery uh, earlier in the case, they did discover some uh, emails uh, in, again, this was in the early days of YouTube before Google had acquired them. They did discover some emails where uh, YouTube uh, employees and executives were saying things that pretty well suggested they knew some of the things that people were uploading to YouTube were, in fact, unlicensed uh, copyrighted material. Uh, the judge is going to have to decide in the first instance is whether those emails are enough to satisfy this requirement of willful blindness. And then, of course, it'll go back to the Second Circuit uh, again to, to see if uh, they agree. Okay, can Jeff, I, jump uh, any thoughts here? Um, <clears throat> yeah, a couple. Uh, I mean, for the most part, I think uh, Larry's, Larry's got this about right. Um, I think the big open question is exactly that, the question of what's going to constitute willful blindness. And, um, and my recollection is that the, the only evidence in this case uh, to support that were, were these emails. That doesn't mean that something else couldn't, but, but that's sort of all we have to go on at the moment. And um, uh, one of the concerns would be how, um, you know, how a startup uh, uh, company that's offering online videos is going to have the wherewithal and the um, uh, ability and the time and everything else to assess from a from the legal standpoint, whatever emerges for when the when the case is remanded, whether the various forms of notice that they might have, including emails, are sufficient to rise to this standard. So there's sort of another layer of uh, um, I don't know of of assessment that has to go on for for companies to avoid you know, falling out of the safe harbor. Um, and, uh, you know, what's, what's potentially, you know, what's worth watching with respect to that is, um, well, there's, there's two ways of thinking of this. For YouTube, th this isn't really an issue anymore. Um, as, uh, as Larry pointed out, what's at issue in this case are some old videos that have long since been dealt with on YouTube. And, um, uh, and Viacom has already sort of made it clear that with the implementation of Content ID, uh, they're not really concerned with YouTube. In fact, they enter into deals all the time and seem to have a pretty cozy relationship outside of this suit. Uh, the the concern then is for the companies that look like YouTube did in the early days of of YouTube, and um, how well they'll be able to comply with the whatever 
complicated legal requirements emerge from uh, from this, which isn't to say that they didn't have that obligation before as well. I, I think things are a little bit muddier now, though, that the safe harbor isn't quite as clear. Uh, I should add, I, I'm not sure that that's a bad thing. I, you know, I think uh, the meta question is is whether we should indeed have um, you know sort of shift the the burden, shift the rights, shift the the various aspects of this. A little bit, in which this does only a little bit, in one direction, either toward the content, uh, the content providers, or toward the um, distributors like YouTube. Um, and I'd love to hear your your all's thoughts on that. I have some views of my own, but um, I've spoken long enough for now. So um, let's let's time travel back here a bit to what YouTube was like uh, when these inf- <clears throat> alleged infringements were taking place. Um, they subsequently have a content ID system. They have a user button that can be pushed to report something that's suspected to be infringing. So they have sort of the community policing the site um, and various other safeguards in place that weren't there at the beginning. And as you said, Larry, there there were emails <coughs> that came out in the case that indicated some knowledge on the part of YouTube as to... Um, infringing material that they were not taking down. Uh, do you think that that'll be sufficient um, in this case to meet the standard that the Second Circuit seems to be setting? Well, I, I don't know. I, I hope not. You know, there's uh, there's really case law in the Ninth Circuit that suggests otherwise, uh, mm-hmm. and uh, and it may be that what we're getting here is kind of a, a circuit split. Uh, but uh, you know, I don't know the the, the emails. Uh, I haven't looked at them for a while. Of course, you know, one thing to remember, too, is this case has been going on for a very long time. And as Jeff said, uh, Viacom is no longer uh, at war with YouTube. And in fact, they're, they're, they're quite well connected to each other. One good question is why they continue to pursue this litigation at all. They should probably just settle it for some nominal uh, amount of damages and make it go away. Uh, unless they have some some bigger uh, issue in the back of their minds, or there's something else going on, uh, and uh, and maybe Jeff has some ideas about that. I don't, <laughs> but I I don't think that those emails really are enough to defeat the safe harbor. Or what I should say is, if they are enough to dece- defeat the safe harbor, it's not much of a harbor anymore, and that mm-hmm. I think would be a very bad thing. Yes, that's why I have my little boat behind me here. It's searching for a safe harbor, and it's getting harder to har- harder and harder for it to find one. Um, right. Jeff, uh, let's talk about um, the existing class plaintiffs that have been reinstated um, with this determination. Now, they, unlike Viacom, have some complaints about what's going on now on the site. Um, mm-hmm. That you know, you can still cruise around and find infringing things. It's not that difficult. You need only do a search. Um, And I think they would say that YouTube safeguards aren't working and there should be some liability that attaches from that safe harbors aside. Um, What's your response to that? Uh, Well, I I mean, you you hit the nail on the head is what I was thinking of when I when I said, you know, not I'm not entirely sure sort of what's the appropriate place to draw the line. When it comes mm-hmm. to Viacom, it's, there's not only, as Larry said, is there not um, uh, sort of factually much of an issue now, but the ability for Viacom and YouTube to um, to negotiate, solve the various problems here, as they have done, for example, by, um, you know, essentially um, uh, you know, sidestepping the whole DMCA issue by offering some sort of a license, you, know, you can imagine Viacoms and YouTubes of the world doing that. The harder thing is for the smaller content providers who are, who are more concerned and for whom that would probably be prohibitively expensive. So um, so what kind of protections should they have? Um, and you know, then you're getting into a really narrow, sort of nitty-gritty kind of question that, uh, on the one hand, I don't think this does much to, to, um, to help with. Um, on the other hand, um, I... Or I am, those aren't really different hands, but in addition, uh, I would I would say, um, you know, I mean, my gut is the the kinds of protections that that YouTube has in place, the ability, as you pointed out, for uh, for users to click a button to indicate potentially um, copyright violating material, the ability for these relatively small um, content providers to actually track their their content. Um, 
that's that's actually an important di- distinction between the Viacoms and the smaller uh, uh, plaintiffs and potential plaintiffs. Um, they don't have as much content. You know, but, I mean, Viacom would have a hell of a time trying to keep track of everything. But a small enough content provider wouldn't have quite the same problem. And um, meanwhile, I think at, you know, at the same time, people lament often the various forms of, uh, of concentration that seem to exist in this and other industries. But honestly, if all of your videos are on you know, Vimeo and YouTube, again, it becomes a lot easier to make sure that there's um, no violations, or at least no violations that particularly matter. So um, I have a hard time being very sympathetic with those, those plaintiffs because it looks to me like, um, like it shouldn't be that hard under the the current DMCA and its and its doctrine and the various technological implementations that are in place, both on YouTube side and their own as well, the things like watermarking and other things that facilitate this. Um, I don't know. It doesn't look like it should be such a substantial problem to them, but I, I you know, but it may be, and, and and I think ultimately this does require a close sort of factual. Um, determination. And unlike a lot of people, I think it is quite possible and quite potentially quite appropriate to decide this case in a sense or that sort of case for the, to the benefit of the, um, of the content providers. I don't think they should not have the ability at a reasonable cost to make sure that their copyright isn't being violated. Right. But the devil's in the details for that, huh? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I don't know. I, just, I don't know what those costs are. And, uh, um, uh, and, and of course, they change all the time. I and mean, one of the benefits of a safe harbor is that it um, it often well it has costs and benefits. One of the benefits is you don't necessarily have to make reference to all of those technologies. You comply with a certain set of of uh, legal requirements, and um, it's kind of irrespective of the changing ability for for both um, providers, content providers, and distributors to um, uh, avoid the copyright violations. Um, at the same time. Things you know, things like a, um, a safe harbor, you know, build a kind of static, uh, sa- uh, you know, static position into this that unfortunately doesn't change as technology changes. And um, you know, it's, I, I don't want to read too much into this, but it's of course quite possible that this is reflective of a kind of sense that perhaps the technology has changed. Uh, not that the judge judges said this, but um, perhaps the technology has changed to such an extent that the existing safe harbor looks like it's not uh, sort of drawing the line in, in what they view as the, the right place. Um, but that'll take a lot of hashing out to, to figure out in the future. Right. Larry, you raised the issue of why the heck hasn't this case gone away at this point? Mm-hmm. Um, Professor Goldman has a great post all about the decision and uh, seems particularly rankled by that particular uh, fact that the case goes on and on and has lost a lot of its relevance. Um, and yet the parties can't seem to put it to bed. Uh, it, it seems, you know, in hindsight, now seeing how the Second Circuit has come down, it certainly would have been in Google's interest, it would seem, to to have Lewis Stanton's uh, words be the last word on the subject. Uh, but Viacom couldn't very well let that happen. Um, so at least that probably explains why they've, you know, gone down the road and knocked on the Second Circuit's door. Um, now is Google in the position where it can't let what the Second Circuit has done stand? <laughs> I'm not so sure about that. As I, mean, as I said at the beginning, this is more of a, a, a win for Viacom than it is a loss for, for uh, Google. Uh, the, the willful blindness language is troubling, and we'll have to see how that gets litigated uh, going on with the rest of this case. But again, you know, the exposure that's left for uh, Google and YouTube, even after the Second Circuit, is for a very small number of videos. And as Jeff points out, uh, YouTube itself, you know, has introduced all these uh, technological uh, fixes and all these uh, filtering and monitoring software for content owners to use. Uh, probably it isn't going to face future litigation uh, from from Viacom or other content providers uh, as long as they are satisfied that it's doing its share. Uh, it's really the, the risk is not so much for, for Google as it is for, as Jeff said, for, for startups uh, and other uh, services that just don't have the same kind of resources that, that, that Google does. Right. Uh, from uh, Professor Goldman's post is an interesting point. He, he compares 
the launching of a Section 512C safe harbor defense to a military strategy or campaign um, that uh, the defense has to work equally well across its entire border while the adversary can concentrate an attack and only has to succeed on one point of attack to win. Um, what I'm now sort of catching this from uh, Eric Goldman's blog, it doesn't matter that YouTube won most of the points of contention. If any single point of contention fails, its defense fails. Um, so, you know, is this something that, uh, that is going to be problematic uh, in the long term, do you think, Jeff? Um, oh, I don't know. I, I, yeah, we've added an additional sort of um, co bit of complexity, this uh, the willful blindness aspect to, um, mm -hmm. to, to the safe harbor. And so, you know, that, that there's, I don't think there's any way that that can uh, not increase the compliance costs and compliance difficulties for um, distributors in YouTube's position. But, um, you know, but it isn't necessarily a, um, you know, a massive sort of thing. This goes to Larry's point. It's not clear that YouTube really lost much here. And, and I should say, it's definitely not clear that YouTube itself lost much for the reasons we've been discussing. But it's not even clear that this is necessarily going to be something that, um, that other companies, smaller startups and the like, can't overcome as well. Um, but, you know, there's no, there's no doubt that it seems to raise the cost. It creates a little bit more uncertainty. Um, but I don't, I don't know. I don't see it being transformative. I think I, d I do. I have a, um, a conspiracy theory thought, if you want to hear it about <laughs> why the case persists. Um, you know, I think, uh, uh, I, 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 I've, all right, there's a, there's a non-conspiracy theory version of this, which is a, you know, sort of, um, the human psychology piece of this companies like Viacom, uh, live and die by their whether they should or not, and I should say, right, they live and die, but it looks like increasingly they're dying by their um, by their copyright. And uh, you know, I think they see they, they see uh, principle behind these things, um, uh, and and they they see their business model coming under existential threats from um, the absence of their their relatively easy ability to protect their copyrights and. You know, they're scared and um, and they take it very personally and that's not necessarily a good business decision and the amounts of money that have been poured into this case that could have been used to you know make better content I wish I had a quick command something terrible that Viacom is responsible for that they could make better but you know they could, <laughs> they could do I'm sure they could do some better programming um, and uh, so you know so that's unfortunate but that it happens that way but it does people are human the more conspiracy theory version of this um, relates to, um, as so much in a, the tech world does today, the ongoing fight between Google and Microsoft. Um, and uh, you know, Microsoft has a lot of, of, in lots of different ways, some close ties with Viacom. They have worked together in the past. They have a, a sort of, a, I don't know what you call it, a policy um, entity called Arts and Labs that they started together that... Um, comments on on copyright and piracy and other sorts of um, issues that are relevant to both companies um, and uh, you know I think that um, it's not a huge stretch to suggest that um, Viacom is in a sense um, pursuing this case as, as thoroughly as they are as a um, either well, either explicit or implicit kind of part of Microsoft's ongoing war against Google this is more about hitting them as hard as they can than it is about protecting their interests, which are perfectly well protected at this point, as we've suggested. All right. Well, well, that's a great conspiracy theory. We'll have to see how that plays out. And we may never know, you know. No, no of course not. <laughs> and I have no evidence to support that, of course. So that's right. <laughs> as, as, as the best conspiracy theories. Yes, exactly. Okay, well, we'll continue to watch this case as it goes back to the district court and uh, see if Viacom or the class plaintiffs manage to attach any liability to YouTube, uh, which they've not been able to do so far. In the meantime, though, uh, net neutrality continues to be a thing that requires attention and uh, perspective. And, and one perspective uh, is the one that you've offered this week, Larry, in your piece about Comcast and Xfinity and the deal that they've reached to offer their Xfinity service 
on the Xbox and the corollary that, oh, by the way, if you're going to access the Xfinity on Xbox, we're not going to count that against your data cap that you would, your excessive use cap where you're either going to be throttled or charged or whatever it is that, that Comcast does to people who excessively use their internet access. We're just going to carve that out. Now, Tim Wu, who invented the term net neutrality and others have thought that uh, was a very red flag event and shows um, a carrier, Comcast here, giving preferential uh, treatment to its own internet carried traffic coming in through the Xbox um, and that that would violate the FCC's net neutrality rules. You disagree, Larry. Tell us why. Well, for one thing, it's not not internet traffic. I think that's the main point. But to go back, I mean, obviously, you know, Tim and others uh, who are in support of stronger net neutrality rules than what the FCC actually passed uh, think everything is a net neutrality violation. And what it comes down to, I think, in this case is they just don't like the uh, the idea of data caps. And they're trying somehow to shoehorn data caps into the net neutrality debate. Uh, the rules clearly don't apply here because uh, the rules, for one thing, carve out cable TV content that's being sent over the same infrastructure that the ISP, in this case Comcast, uses to provide internet access for its users. And of course, the content we're talking about here is on-demand programming uh, that, like all of the video programming that Comcast sends down that last mile, is not internet traffic. It's Legally, it's not internet traffic. It's cable TV, and it's governed by an incredible wide range of rules and regulations at the federal, state, and local levels about how it can be set up and how it can be transported and who has to get bribed by whom to get it, uh, to get it uh, in place in local franchises. Um, because of that regulation and because from a technical standpoint, the way in which Comcast gets its own content down to your house over the cable is not the same as the way in which it gets internet traffic that you might request down the uh, down that cable. Uh, for those two reasons alone, this has nothing to do with net neutrality. It's not internet content at all. Uh, you know, I have trouble getting my head around that, Larry, because when it's coming in via the Xbox, it's not coming in on the internet or on the um, cable infrastructure. It's not coming into but the cable is. box. Go ahead. It's not what it's so it is coming down the cable infrastructure. It comes from the Comcast uh, head end uh, mm -hmm. and travels entirely within Comcast's uh, last mile sort of network down to your cable modem. And from there, it goes to the Xbox. In this new service, essentially all they're doing is turning the Xbox into a different set top box instead of having an actual. Comcast leased set-top box, you can replace one of those set-top boxes with your existing Xbox. And, of course, this so far is only for the on-demand content, not for all the other 10,000 channels that you might be able to get through your set-top box. But it's not uh, using uh, the public Internet at all, uh, and it's not Internet content. It is cable content. Now, I should go back and say, I understand this is confusing because it is confusing. We're <laughs> seeing uh, a, a tremendous convergence and a lot of change and really a lot of chaotic activity happening with the idea of programming and video content in particular. We've got sort of traditional providers like Comcast who are offering, you know, multi-channel cable services that you pay a subscription for and it's, you know, kind of all you can eat. It's, you know, the kind of you've got some choices about the packages, but basically it's the programming they put together for you. At the same time, we have, uh, over the last several years in particular, the emergence of what are called over-the-top video services. And these are things like Hulu and Netflix and all the others, which are offering some of the very same content, TV shows and right. movies. And they're offering it entirely over the public Internet. Um, and so it's confusing to users because they're saying, well, wait, if, if I'm getting it from on-demand, uh, it's cable content. And it's, by the way, it's regulated as cable content. If I'm getting it from Netflix or Hulu... It's Internet content, and it's not regulated uh, as, uh, as cable content. It's confusing, but it's important to know that, in fact, um, the, the cable side of things, highly regulated. In fact, one of the reasons the over-the-top services got started and why they're doing as well as they are, and let's not forget, Comcast is the largest single 
uh, investor in Hulu as a result of its acquisition of NBC Universal. Uh, one of the reasons these over-the-top services are doing as well as they are is because they're not subject to all the regulations that cable TV providers are subject to at the federal, state, and local level. So to consumers, it looks like, hey, this is all just the same content, video content. Why should it be treated differently? Unfortunately, from both a technical and a legal standpoint, it's very different. Well, from a legal standpoint, I, I think I'm okay with the FCC taking a close look at exempting one service that is available on the Xbox from Comcast's uh, cable usage cap or internet usage cap, let's be clear. Um, when the side-by-side over-the-top services like, say, HBO Go, which is also available, you know, was included in the same announcement, that's going to be included in the cap, right? If it's coming into the Xbox and you're watching it that way. So, it, it sure smacks to me like preferential treatment of Xfinity if Comcast is going to give you a free pass on that, but not on HBO Go. Don't you think? So it's, it's preferential treatment in the same way that all your cable programming gets preferential right. treatment when it mm-hmm. comes down the cable. And I would be perfectly happy to talk about uh, making this a level playing field and just getting content to be content. But to do that would require the dismantling of the existing uh, cable TV regulating uh, structure uh, in, in order to find out, you know, what is the best way technically and from a business model standpoint, should it be a la carte, should it be subscription, should it be some combination? We'd love to find out what the best model is, but as long as the, the cable TV side of things is as heavily regulated as it is, there's going to be all these perverse incentives to, you know, use loopholes or not use loopholes to, uh, to, you know, sort of change the way in which this happens. And we're never going to find out, well, what is it that consumers really do want? What is it that they're willing to pay for until we kind of start by clearing away all the regulatory debris that, uh, that, that makes it impossible for any of these businesses to make rational business decisions outside of the regulatory structure. Jeff, where do you stand on all this? Uh, well, as happens so often, uh, Larry and I completely agree. Um, <laughs> uh, but um, let's see if I can add anything. I, you know, his analysis um, that you were referring to is, um, is really great on this. And as usual, Larry turns a 1,000 word essay into a 10,000 word essay, um, which helps with lots of extra details and the like. Um, but uh, I, I guess the one, the, the one co- additional comment that I might make is um, um, I, I don't think that this version of the net neutrality rules, I know there are those, some who would, who would push for versions that are far more restrictive than what we have now. And I mean, the, and these, you know, they're, they're, they potentially will even emerge. I don't think that this version of the rules is intended, uh, nor do I think the language does this, to uh, restrict a uh, um, to to restrict a, a provider's a network's ability to, um, well, for, for for example, to offer higher speeds of uh, service for a higher price to certain users, um, to offer certain products to some users for a price than than they do to others. Uh, obviously, you can buy a whole range of different services from. From Comcast, um, including some of the some over the top, some not. You can get a different. You can get only local channels. Um, at least you used to be able to. Um, and, and in some sense, I see this as being um, exactly the same thing. This is this is Comcast offering an additional service, effectively the ability to access certain of their content through the Xbox um, in the same w- with the same you know favored um, status that their own content gets because it comes over. Uh, cable instead of over the um, the public internet, and um, uh, I see this as um, you know they're they're engaged in some competition, offering something that's valuable to some of their users uh, in in a hopes in the hopes I assume of attracting more consumers from their potential competitors. I, I don't know. I see this as not only not prohibited by the the spirit of the rules. Um, certainly, the word unreasonably um, potentially. Uh, Allows it by the letter of the rules, and uh, I also see it as being something that we should be we should be promoting in favor. And we should we should think is a, a great innovation rather than something that we we start to criticize. 
Well, this is all going to turn uh, under the FCC's net neutrality rules uh, rolled out last year. Uh, that on the premise that internet <clears throat> providers are not to unreasonably discriminate in transmitting lawful network traffic over a consumer's broad ba- broadband internet access service. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, we've been kind of cutting all hairs on that standard. Um, and, you know, I think I do come down on the side that uh, if if we're using the broadband internet through the cable company's service to deliver content and that's how something gets to the xbox you know it is as you point out larry it's coming in you know to the same modem but then you know it's not going down the you know when you plug in to the cable in your home you're plugging in in a different way than you <coughs> plugging in your xbox your xbox has no cable connector so don't, don't you think it would be um uh, not only uh, permissible, but also desirable. If, for example, Comcast ran a special that allowed you to um, uh, to add an additional box to another TV in your house, and for a period of time, or maybe forever, no, that seems unlikely. For a period of time, said uh, you know, content uh, over that box won't count toward your cap um, as a way of uh, offering a sort of promotion for their customers. I, th- I think that's exactly analogous, other than that it's a, it is in fact a cable box instead of a, um, uh, a different type of device. But, um, but again, I, you know, that strikes me as, as really beneficial competition and not, not something to be discouraged, nor, nor do I see it, as I don't see this, as having any kind of discriminatory intent. Now, that may not be the right standard. It may be discriminatory effect that matters, and we could debate that. But um, uh, I don't know. I, I again, I, I fall back on saying I, even the you know the FCC rules. I don't I don't think that they're meant to to prohibit that kind of um, that kind of sort of business model, and uh, I certainly don't think that they should. Right. Well, in fact, I, but then your issue is is not your issues with the FCC's open internet rule. Then, as opposed to you know, you're pro competition and you think that rule is impacting it. Well, no. Well, I, I, I guess I would say, um, as I read the rule, it doesn't necessarily have to impact this at all. I don't. I, I mean, I, I have trouble with some of the with the rules, and I think they could do better, particularly by not having them at all. But, mm-hmm. uh, but I don't think that's in, that's inconsistent with the rules as they're as they're written, at least as I understand them. So, okay. so I don't. So, in other words, I didn't mean to suggest that I had a problem with the rules. I have a problem with certain people's interpretation of the rules. Okay, Larry. Last word on this. Well, I think it's, you know, again, I want to point out that, that, that one of the reasons the over-the-top services are different and whether or not they're different from a, uh, from a standpoint of the net neutrality rules is another matter. But they're different in that they really don't have any particular incentive to make their uh, delivery of IP packets of content uh, any more efficient than they already are. I mean, one of the reasons that the, the caps are being at least put in place, if not enforced, in the first place, is that the video uh, can be very inefficient, uh, and particularly if, if they're not using you know the most uh, advanced compression technology and so on. On its own programming, on the cable TV side of things <coughs> that comes down that cable, uh, Comcast uses Doxis. It's moving to Doxis three. It's uh, you know putting in as much compression as it can in order to get the most out of that shared cable that's in your neighborhood. Uh, whereas kind of the over-the-top people, well, they don't really have the same incentive to make the most efficient use of your broadband connection. And in fact, you know, even if you're watching the Beverly Hillbillies uh, over the top versus watching the exact same Beverly Hillbillies mm-hmm. through the cable system, uh, the signal, the, the, the sort of the quality uh, of the compression and the quality of the data uh, will look very different. And it may be, again, that uh, unless there's a cap on, there's not going to be incentives for the -the over-the-top providers to do more to make uh, more efficient use of your broadband connection. Well, the one thing that is certain is that more and more of these services are coming online. And as you pointed out, Larry, it's getting more confusing uh, what you're watching where and how you're watching it. Uh, We've had this announcement of all the new content available for Xbox and then... um, Amazon Instant is now available on the, I think it's the PS3. Yeah. Um, so, you know, streaming is definitely becoming mainstream. And my concern with that is that the more that happens, the broker we get because accessing data is 
a wild new world of, you know, how you're going to be priced and, and um, forced to pay for that. So uh, having just invested in a, a Wi-Fi hotspot that my son uses to watch content, you know, in the car or in airports or what have you, um, I'm getting up close and personal exposure to how fast fat, five gigabytes of data will go. And it goes very fast and is expensive. Um, you know, and it, that's not going to get any better as all of this plays out. So uh, hopefully it'll all shake out for the best interests of competition and consumers. But I think we're, we're away, <laughs> away from that. Hmm. Let's, uh, let's talk next about uh, Senator Franken. <laughs> And uh, his comments about uh, antitrust and privacy and the net. He spoke to the American Bar Association this week. You want to tell us about that, Jeff, and uh, what insights the good senator had for us? Oh, that'll be a short comment. Um, <laughs> uh, well, so, you know, basically um, the uh, the senator uh, was talking to the um, the spring antitrust meeting of the American Bar Association. So it was an antitrust oriented speech, although of course there's a lot of consumer protection uh, that's, that goes on at that meeting as well. But it was, um, it was basically about um, uh, the privacy aspects of uh, antitrust, the ways in which privacy issues can raise antitrust concerns. And he mentioned a bunch of different things. He referred to Google about 26 times. He certainly talked about Facebook a little bit. Um, he, uh, you know, he basically d said that he's afraid of these companies' ability to to um, uh, to collect certain types of data. Uh, he was particularly uh, uncomfortable with their ability to store certain types of data, um, mostly. You know, PII, personally identifiable information. Um, I think that uh, uh, he had a, a lot of comments to try to turn it into an antitrust issue that were either factually incorrect or um, or irrelevant for antitrust purposes. He mentioned at one point that, um, uh, in a sense, you're locked into Google if you if you use if you if you don't want to. Sorry, you're locked into Google's privacy policies. If you use Google, you're stuck. You have to share your allow them to share your their inf your information with other sites, for example, under their new privacy policy. Um, and uh, right, uh, it seems to me like excuse me for interrupting, but it seems to me like he's trying to redefine what monopoly is in in his comments about Google, and and that he's got a bit of a point, and maybe we need to examine <laughs> what a monopoly is in light of what how these online services function because his point was that you know you can obviously <clears throat> decide to opt out of google services um not use their email not use their search um, their documents everything else um and simply go to another competing provider but his point is that you know the competition is such that google sort of knocked this one out of the park and there's really no one you can go to that can can offer you that kind of comprehensive and quality experience. So hence, you're locked into their privacy policies. So he's what he's doing is sort of replacing the d current definitions of monopoly with it's difficult. And you know, I t I'm guessing Jeff that you think that that's not a good idea, but but I'm also hmm. thinking that that maybe he does have a point and can, can you address both those things? Sure. Well, I, I think that, um, uh, you know, first of all, um, he makes some implicit uh, assumptions there that are, um, that are dramatically unwarranted. It, uh, in particular, about the, uh, um, the, the costs and benefits. And in his view, he seems to only discuss the costs. Uh, actually, that's not fair. He, but he certainly focuses on the costs of uh, of um, this information that's collected by and used by the likes of Google and Facebook. Um, in his mind, and and if I understand the way you just presented the question, um, they get to collect all of this data. If you want to use them, you have to allow them to do the things that they say they want to do with data. You do actually have a lot of choice over what they do with your data, but uh, but there's some limits to that. And uh, and in his view, that's problematic. Um, in my view, it's 
it's exceptional. It's fantastic. Uh, the things that Google and, and Facebook and these other companies can do and can offer their users um, by virtue of their ability to, to collect and, and use and share that data across sites is phenomenal. It makes my experience much, much better. And that does, I don't want to impose my view of, um, of uh, these companies' use of information on everyone else, but I certainly don't want Al Franken to impose his on me, and unfortunately, he is in a much better position to do that than I am. And uh, I think it's dangerous for, for someone in his position to talk about uh, privacy, to talk about uh, information in such one-sided terms without really explicitly acknowledging the amazing benefits of it. And, uh, and that's why I, I think this you know, sort of implicit um, conflation of, of collection of lots of data with uh, you know, the sort of new definition of monopoly, as you put it, is, 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 is really problematic. Now, it, it may be that you could conceivably identify certain uses. It's actually probably not the uses that are the problem. You could probably identify, possibly identify certain, um, uh, certain behavior, certain conduct at the time of the collection of data, uh, deception being the most obvious that the, F, you know, the FTC under its consumer protection statutes already polices this. Um, you know, a firm that deceives you and in, in, uh, uh, induces you to share information with them that they ultimately use in some um, in some way that you didn't intend, I, you know, I can see that being something we worry about. But it's not an antitrust problem; it's a it's a consumer protection problem, and it's um, uh, and it's perfectly under the FTC's purview to deal with it now. And if we end up making um, the the maintenance, the collection and maintenance of large amounts of data into a uh, not that anyone's arguing this, but almost a per se um, antitrust problem, we're going to be curtailing some of the most valuable and and you know amazing um, uh, technologies on the internet today. That strikes me as very very dangerous. What do you think, uh, Larry? Yeah, the second question, which I don't remember. Yeah, the second question was just whether, um, and, and I think you did get to it. Whether whether Senator Franken has a point that. In the shifting world that we exist in, where lock-in can happen um, in a way that doesn't involve having uh, complete market domination of an area of commerce, um, lock-in can happen in a lot of other ways. Um, does the definition of monopoly need to adjust with that? You know, is it appropriate? Maybe difficult is is uh, right. not an appropriate definition, but is there some room to you know look at this and say it's not just pure market power? We've got to take some other things into account. Oh, can, can I address that really quickly? Yeah. Uh, um, certainly, under the existing standard, as basically established by the Microsoft case. Um, Something like lock-in or or switching costs, barriers to both barriers to entry and barriers to exit by consumers are indeed relevant to the the, the current antitrust analysis. I don't think we have yeah. to do anything new to to incorporate those concepts. Um, what I, what I think is is um, is most interesting here is the. Um, I guess in a way I would say I think we do actually have to rethink the way we, we think about market uh, power and, and the definition of markets here. But in the, probably in the opposite direction uh, <laughs> that, that Senator Franken would go, um, I think we're so prone to, to creating silos to separate Google from Facebook, from, uh, you know, from, from eBay, from various other Internet providers. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that's increasingly becoming an untenable um, uh, position to take. Increasingly, these 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 entities are offering similar products to the end users. To take out to take Franken's point, where he says you're not the user, you're the product. Um, from that perspective, these companies are are absolutely doing the same thing. They are all providing access to eyeballs. They're they're selling advertising, and selling it to companies for a higher price, depending on how many and what quality of uh, of their users are going to see their advertising. Well, it doesn't really matter whether they're seeing it on a search, uh, following a search on Google, or or while they're um, looking at their friends' cat videos on Facebook. Um, they're they're selling something that is absolutely competing with each other. To 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 define a market and to define market power and in in Franken's thinking the absence of competition here um, in such a way that separates Facebook from Google for for to take the most obvious example is 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 a mistake. And um, if 
if users care a lot about the privacy and the kinds of information that these firms are making available to advertisers, um, they will, I believe, they will respond accordingly and that there's um, certainly sufficient competition here to ensure that, uh, that um, they're, you know, so they're pretty well protected beyond the obvious ability to simply stop using one of these, uh, uh, one of these services. Right. Larry, uh, Senator Franken certainly pays attention to, to privacy issues frequently and will probably be involved in any congressional um, efforts to, to further regulate the technology industry along these lines. Do you, do you think that, you know, as Jeff was saying, it's, it's kind of dangerous to take his perspective and, and for him to voice his perspective without, you know, looking at the whole picture or, or uh, what are your thoughts on this? Well, it's hard to know how seriously to take Senator Franken on this and, and similar issues. I mean, he's really well known for a lot of kind of uh, aggressive saber rattling against the tech industry. Uh, uh, it's not really clear how he would actually legislate uh, some of these things if he actually had the ability to, to get his legislation through. I think a lot of it is aimed at trying to shape behavior or kind of exact tribute from the tech companies uh, on the threat of possible legislation. But Jeff is right. The, the risk here of applying antitrust uh, to to the behavior of you know essentially very young technology companies is uh, is a very serious risk. And I think the Microsoft case is a good example of just how bad a fit antitrust law is uh, in the tech industry. It's true that uh, because of the way you know technology works and and the economic principle of network effects. That, that young technology companies, let's say Facebook, even Google, uh, Twitter, they can establish uh, very strong markets, what looks t- from the traditional antitrust perspective as market dominance or even monopoly in a very short amount of time. But anybody who's actually been in the tech sector for more than than a decade will realize that those uh, th- those those so-called monopolies just don't last very long, and it's not because the government intercedes and saves us. It's because the next generation of technology and the next generation of innovation is only a couple turns of Moore's law away, and those next generation of innovations very often will break the dominance of the sort of you know last generation's uh, set of uh, of what looked like impenetrable barriers. And create a whole new set of uh, of uh, participants and competitors, and a new set of dominators who also won't last very long. Uh, antitrust is uh, is by de- by contrast very slow uh, and uh, and very confusing, and uh, it's applied by judges who know nothing about technology, uh, regulators and government agencies who know nothing about technology. You know the the market works here really really well, and uh, it's not perfect, but it sure does a lot better job than the FTC. All right. Well, we've got lots more to discuss about antitrust. And also, apparently, it's not Facebook who's infringing patents. It's uh, it's Yahoo, says Facebook. Um, so we'll get to all that and more right after we thank our sponsor for th- this episode of This Week in Law, which is Netflix. Netflix streams thousands of TV episodes and movies directly to you instantly, saving you time, money, and hassle. There are several easy ways to instantly access streaming movies and TV shows with Netflix. You can watch Netflix movies and TV shows on your Mac or PC or iPad. You can watch on your iPhone and some Android phones too. If you have a gaming console, as we were discussing earlier, you can watch Netflix right on your Xbox 360, uh, PS3, Nintendo Wii. Um, That brings it all right to your television, however it's coming in via the cable pipes or the broadband internet service. If you're uh, not a gamer, you can watch Netflix on your TV with an Apple TV box or a Roku box, which are both inexpensive and easy to use. And you can watch movies and TV shows instantly using any of these devices. As you begin watching a movie, you can enjoy that experience in one location. Take a break, move to your car, move to another room, pick it up, and it's going to finish up right where you left off. You're not going to lose your place at all. However you access Netflix, you can watch as many movies and TV shows as you want anytime you want, and you can cancel anytime. So please try it today for 30 days absolutely free. Go to netflix.com slash twit. When you use that URL, it lets them know that we sent you. We greatly appreciate that, and we greatly appreciate Netflix's support of the Twit Network, and of This Week in Law. We hope you enjoy watching instantly with Netflix. 
All right. Well, let's uh, talk about Microsoft. I'm sorry, not Microsoft. Let's talk about Microsoft. Let's talk about Microsoft <laughs> and Motorola, Motorola Mobility and uh, the fact that Microsoft is not happy that it is paying a whole lot in royalties to be able to use various technologies that are patented by Motorola Mobility. And in fact, it's so unhappy with this situation that it has lodged a complaint with the European Commission, which is now investigating Motorola Mobility um, on antitrust concerns. Uh, Jeff, this sounds like a, a kind of a whole lot of whining on Microsoft's part about something that, you know, if the shoe is on the other foot, it collects a whole mm -hmm. lot of royalties from people who <clears throat> use its patents as well. Um, mm -hmm. Does it have anything to talk about here? And should the European Commission be concerned? Uh, well, let, let me first raise my, um, my same conspiracy theory point. There can be, <laughs> I think, no... Um, I think in this case, a lot, it's a lot easier to see. Uh, Motorola, of course, is um, in the process of being purchased by Google. And uh, it's hard to see this as, um, as anything but um, uh, another battle in the ongoing war by, that Microsoft's been waging on Google. Um, that isn't to say they don't have, have perfectly colorable issues, and nor is it to say that there isn't a lot of money involved and, and um, they wouldn't like to win here. But... Um, uh, so that that aside, uh, the the you know the actual legal question, which we're probably supposed to talk about, uh, is whether the European antitrust authorities um, have or should intervene. I'm sorry, have a, a an antitrust concern that is reasonable, or should intervene in this uh, in this case. Um, and and as I, I wrote recently, I, I I think the answer is is no. Um, but you know that's with limited information. But I, I would be very surprised to find that there's a, a good justification for an antitrust intervention here. In particular, I think that the royalties that Motorola is asking for are are seemingly very reasonable. I don't know all of the the royalty asks in this uh, in this realm, but I do have at least one point of comparison, which is the amount of royalty that. Microsoft seeks on some of its patents that are uh, sold in Android devices, like the Nook. There's a, a lawsuit with Barnes and Noble over this. Uh, they ask for somewhere between two and three percent of the price of the device um, for as royalties for their technology. Um, this is perfectly in line with that. Uh, meanwhile, I think that uh, another issue that um, that has so so one of the issues is high high royalties, um, and it's potentially you know it's a it's a it's been done before that this is an antitrust problem. In Europe, a lot more things can be antitrust problems than here. Here, in fact, by the way, I would say that in the standard setting, the technology standard setting context following uh, Rambus and, uh, and 9X, um, uh, I think it's pretty clear that without deception, there's no antitrust case here. Um, and and that could very well be why the, the DOJ hasn't um, taken any action here. They approved the Google's purchase of Motorola and they have not seen fit uh, to to raise concerns over um, the royalty rates um, in Europe, things aren't as clear cut, but it does make sense to me to draw a line there. If there's deception if a firm enters into a standard setting process, pretending it doesn't have certain essential patents, and then all of a sudden says, "Oh, by the way, we forgot to mention these, and you're going to have to pay us an exorbitant amount to license them." Um, I don't know, you know. Maybe that's an antitrust problem. Maybe it's not. At least it's colorable here. It, this is just a negotiation. Uh, Microsoft is is suing Motorola, and they are, in fact, in addition to the, the antitrust case, they are engaged in litigation in Washington State. Um, Microsoft is suing Motorola over their initial offer. Motorola said, "Here's what we want for our licenses," and um, uh, and as far as I know, there hasn't been a whole lot of negotiation over that. But there there can be. That's not at all. Um, uh, um, not allowed in the standard setting process. It happens all the time, bilateral negotiations between various members of the standard over the royalty rates. Um, so I don't, I don't see the offer of a price that Microsoft deems to be high to be an antitrust problem, particularly when if the relevant standard, as it is in these cases, is, um, is fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory. As uh, the judge in the Washington District Court case says, it is not at all clear what's reasonable um, at the time that an initial royalty ask is made. 
um, and of course, it will always be the case that reasonable for for Motorola um, uh, will not necessarily be exactly the same as reasonable for Microsoft. So, intervening on any trust grounds because there's a disagreement over how high the royalty amount should be seems seems at best premature, but probably also something that just should be avoided to begin with. There's a separate issue over the use of injunctions to enforce uh, standards essential patents, also mentioned by the European Commission in their for, uh, uh, formal proceeding initiation against Motorola. Um, and again, I, you know, I find this to be um, uh, not something that should be a, of an antitrust concern either. I think injunctions are you know, perfectly appropriate and actually in some ways superior means of enforcing property rights, whether in the standard setting or elsewhere, um, in an effort not to, to gum up the works, as most people assume, but rather to ensure that the relevant parties come to the table and negotiate over the terms of the agreement. Uh, I think the threat of an injunction serves that purpose a lot better than just about any other um, device. And again, I don't see it as a, an inherent antitrust problem. In fact, quite the opposite. I see it as quite beneficial, the ability to threaten or use an injunction to, um, to, to um, uh, uh, reach agreement over licensing rates. Um, I don't see how that, that should or could be considered an inherent antitrust problem. And, if, and uh, just to finish this long diatribe, as you point out, um, if the shoe were on the other foot, as it currently and often is, Microsoft yeah. would take a very, very different view. And as I, I, I won't quote it now, but uh, in the Forbes piece that I wrote recently, I quote at length from a filing that Microsoft made with the Federal Trade Commission in the process of their um, antitrust and IP uh, um, evaluation that they did last year. And it's language that you would expect to see in Motorola's case, in, the, in Motorola's briefs in this case. It is, it is 180 degrees diametrically opposed to the line that Microsoft is taking here. And that's because there are all kinds of settings in which Microsoft does and should indeed take the uh, opposite line. So I, I find this to be... Um, uh, a big waste of time, I guess. All right. Well, uh, what uh, <laughs> Facebook hasn't found to be a waste of time is uh, getting back to Yahoo in its lawsuit <laughs> over patent infringement. Uh, we have Facebook's counterclaim having just been filed and its uh, response to the complaint. So it has some affirmative defenses that it's asserted and some actual claims of patent infringement against Yahoo that it's now tossing back into the mix saying, no, 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 Yahoo, we're not infringing. In fact, you are. Uh, interestingly, four of the 10 patents that Microsoft is asserting in its counterclaim were just picked up on March 30th uh, from, was it NYU, I believe? Yeah. Uh, yes. So- uh, and you, you mean Facebook? Yes, sorry. Facebook. I'm, I am accusing my tech giants right and left today, but yes, Facebook. It's not and always Microsoft. Are, uh, <laughs> going at each other. Um, so, Larry, do you think uh, that these guys will just, you know, agree to pay each other exorbitant royalties and make this thing go away, or what do you think is going to happen with this uh, Facebook Yahoo patent dispute? Well, th this case is so, it's just tragic on so many levels. I mean, it, it, just to start with, this really is kind of the, the end game for Yahoo. And it's the end game because, you know, we've seen this in so many other cases. Uh, uh, Kodak now is nothing but essentially a, a, a patent enforcing company left. When, a, when an innovator runs out of innovation, when they're sort of nearing the end of their life, and that seems to be what's happening with Yahoo, uh, pretty much all they've got left is to start enforcing their patents. And the problem that we have is that the patents are garbage. All these patents are garbage. Facebook's patents are garbage. Yahoo's patents are garbage. Uh, everybody's patents, frankly, are garbage, particularly when it comes to, uh, to software patents and business method patents. The Patent Office in the United States in particular has for years uh, adopted an extremely low threshold for approving patents in this area. Partly it's because they don't have the expertise to actually review them. Partly it's because we shouldn't be granting patents for business methods and for software in the first place. And partly it's because patent examiners are incentivized to get through as many applications as they can and it's much easier to say yes than it is to say no. So what they've done is essentially is to outsource to the litigation market the actual determination of whether a patent should have been approved or not in the first place. And the result has been thousands, hundreds of thousands of junk patents that are just flooding the market. 
Uh, everybody's got their own little you know collection of them, and whenever they start a negotiation with another partner, or in this case, in Yahoo's case, whenever they're they're looking for a life preserver, uh, the first thing you do is file a lawsuit claiming that all your junk patents are being uh, violated, infringed by the other side. And then, of course, they file their counterclaim saying, no, no, our junk patents are, in fact, the ones that are being infringed. And then they proceed, as you suggest, to negotiate, uh, you know, cross-licensing agreements. And maybe, you know, one side winds up paying the other side some royalties. But the bottom line is these patents are all terrible. Uh, and what they lined up doing is sort of shutting out startups who want to come in. And they, of course, aren't part of these cross-licensing deals. So they're the ones who are really harmed. Uh, in, in the final analysis by this, we just had last year, of course, you know, quote unquote, major patent reform legislation passed by Congress after several years of trying really hard to do so. The legislation that was passed does nothing uh, to reform any of the truly uh, awful abuses of the patent system that I'm describing here. Uh, we're going to see more of this. Uh, it's just a complete you know, waste of time, waste of money, just, you know, life uh, employment for lawyers, the patent system is a disaster. Yeah, and just to underscore that, your colleague Jeff Kerstetner at CNET, you sent in this article for us to look at, Larry, uh, has a great piece on the cost of fighting patent lawsuits. And you can look at this and all the wonderful stuff that we've used to prepare for the show today um, at our discussion points, delicious.com slash this week in law slash 156. But he basically has... Um, uh, given the rundown of a report conducted by the American Intellectual Property Law Association, they did a survey uh, for the costs of fighting patent suits uh, based on the amount that was at risk. If you've got less than a million dollars in disputes, so you're being sued for a million dollars or less uh, in a patent suit, you can expect before you know the end of the day to spend $650,000 uh, dispending or defending that suit. I'm, I'm guessing that's if it goes the course. And then on up from there, if you've got more than 25 million at risk, you can expect to spend about 5 million in legal fees. Um, I think this just goes to what you're saying, Larry. We've got a system that's benefiting no one here except for perhaps the legal industry. Well, the legal industry and in some ways the incumbent. I mean, in, in some ways, Companies, large companies, with the cost of asserting your own patent, and you may have a legitimate real patent to assert here, when the legal costs are so high, then uh, then really it doesn't come down to the merits anymore. Who's got the the right patent? Whether that patent should have been granted in the first place? Who is in fact infringing or is not? This has nothing to do with how these cases are decided. It's all about who can afford to outlast the other party in extensive, you know, long-standing litigation and negotiation. Almost no patent cases go to trial. Uh, it, almost none of these patents are actually tested uh, in court and an actual determination made about either their validity or infringement. It really comes down to kind of a, a war of, of uh, you know, a, a waste, a wasting away the other side. And if you've got a bigger uh, bank account, you're going to win regardless of the merits. I, Jeff, I, I knew we'd find disagreement. <laughs> I knew we'd find disagreement if we if we went long enough. Um, I, yeah, I, uh, I guess um, I'm not entirely unsympathetic to the, the points that Larry raises, but I think they miss uh, an enormous am of, uh, amount of uh, of uh, sort of corresponding data on the other side. Um, you know, it's one thing to say, for example, that a patent suit costs um, 1.25 million or five million dollars or or whatever it is, um, <clears throat> but uh, but let's remember that the the entity whose whose patent may be being violated, and and you know the fact that they all patents aren't uh, aren't issued perfectly doesn't necessarily mean that a lot are um, are not actually perfectly valid and good patents. Um, you know, we're basically saying, uh, well, it's too expensive to litigate these things, so let's just take away the right to enforce your property right from those who have a patent. Like it or not, the system we have does indeed. Grant patents under this system, where the the you, dramatically overworked USPTO um, uh, evaluates patents for a couple of minutes and then decides whether they're valid or not, and that may be a very good case for for ditching the the presumption of validity, which mm -hmm. also has a, a fee shifting effect to it. But that's not a, a good case for for 
ditching the the system of property rights that has, um, I think, actually served us remarkably well. It is also, by the way, a very good case, again, for injunctions over these um, uh, um, uh, and these the types of litigation that are that are being described here, the ones that cost the, the, all of this money are the ones where you have to go through, uh, you know, the massive expense of trying to establish what the right price is, what the, right, what the royalty should be, what the damages are. That's really, really hard. Well, you don't have to do that in an injunction suit. It's either you find, you find infringement and then you either, uh, uh, you stop using the patent or you get hit with a massive fee that is, you know, the only way of um, a contempt for, under a contempt proceeding that is the only way of enforcing the uh, the injunction. Well, that's a very strong incentive to negotiate over these things. And I don't think we want to take away the ability of parties that have perfectly valid enforceable patents to force those who are using their patents to negotiate with them to, to license them. Just because it costs money to a startup or anyone else to license someone else's intellectual property is not a reason to um, is not a reason to get rid of the intellectual property any more than the fact that it costs me rent to open my shop on Main Street is a reason to um, remove the innovation of private property in in uh, in land. So um, so you know, I I agree these things are expensive and and um, but as Larry points out they rarely actually go to trial. What happens is you bring one of these suits and and you negotiate and you you negotiate a license or the other party. Um, uh, improvises and finds a way around the uh, the patent, um, or uh, uh, you know, occasion, or it means you you cease and desist, and and sometimes that is in fact the appropriate outcome. Sometimes a company has intellectual property that, for whatever reason, they can't reach a an, a, an agreement on what price at what price it should be licensed, and and that means you don't get to use it. And um, uh, and I just say one final thing. Larry's absolutely right that the patent reform didn't do anything to solve this problem. But in part, that's because I think it was directed in precisely the wrong direction. Uh, what patent reform did was to exacerbate the massive uncertainty that uh, exists in the litigation of these uh, of these patents. And it's the uncertainty that it makes it so attractive for the parties to go to court. It's like going to the, you know, it's like going to Vegas. A court <laughs> might give you, uh, uh, you know, Lord knows what a court might give you, but, you know, massive royalties, all kinds of other things um, that you couldn't have gotten through negotiation. And for some parties, particularly big incumbent players, um, that's a, um, uh, that's a, that's a great um, tool to have in your toolkit, but it's the uncertainty. It's the um, it's the the you know it's the eBay case. It's the you know making it harder to get injunctions. It's Bilski. It's a, a bunch of other things that are actually nominally patent reform that I think have actually exacerbated this problem and indeed do protect the incumbents at the at the great expense of the startups that um, that need patent protection in order in many cases in order to be able to get financing. Uh, a lot of them are built on on patents, and I would think it would be a shame to take away their ability to to um, uh, to build their businesses on and protect those patents. And I think that's what you do by 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 making it less certain, by making their by uh, by pursuing a system that that permits these big companies to um, um, to play you know to play roulette by going to court. Um, I, you know, I I agree that that makes things a lot worse, but. It's not, uh, it's not the existence of the property rights, nor is it the existence of their strong enforceability that causes that problem. No, again, the devil's in the details and the fact that a lot of patents get granted that, that probably shouldn't. And the, the yeah. infrastructure at the USPTO is not what we'd like it to be. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think that that's that's well, that's that's possibly true. It's pro it's probably true. Well, I think it's around. Correct me if I'm wrong. Maybe fifty percent of pat litigated patents that end up being invalidated in the litigation. Um, that seems like way too high a rate to, yeah. for example, to uh, to have a presumption of validity from from the PTO granting a patent. And that's <laughs> the kind think. of thing that could be tweaked. <laughs> right, right. So Just you could tweak that. I, I I agree. Or you know, give more money to the to the PTO as if that's going to solve anything. Right. Throwing more money always solves problems. Hey, Larry, I can't have you on the show without talking about Spectrum. You are my go-to <laughs> guru on all things Spectrum related. Uh, I guess now we have a deal. Uh, Verizon is trying to beef up its ability to provide services, so it's uh, entering, attempting to enter into a deal with Spectrum Co. And uh, the FCC's taken a look at that. Larry, you want to tell us what's going on there? 
Yeah, and in fact, it, it, Jeff had a really good filing uh, in this mm-hmm. case. Uh, with, with the uh, investigation, so he can talk about it too. But uh, the situation was that a consortium of cable companies uh, some years ago uh, bought a piece of AWS spectrum, about to 20 megahertz, a very nice spectrum, with, I think, the you know genuine intent not of warehousing it, but of using it to build uh, yet a, another uh, wireless network, and uh, have simply determined that that does not financially feasible for you know the the startup costs of putting up a, a brand new uh, wireless network are in the, the tens of billions and so they decided that they would now like to sell that spectrum of course it's worth a hell of a lot more than it was when they bought it and that's fine um, and uh, Verizon among others uh, talked to them about the purchase and about ultimately Verizon offered the the winning price and so uh, they're the ones who are now trying to uh, acquire that. The FCC has uh, not, of course, ruled on this uh, transfer of license yet, but there's a lot of folks who uh, object to it and uh, feel that uh, giving any more spectrum to, uh, to Verizon or AT&T uh, is a bad idea under any circumstances, under, at any price, and essentially uh, just object to them uh, having more spectrum no matter how they get it and no matter who they get it from. So there's, uh, there, there are a lot of folks that are encouraging the FCC here to reject the deal, uh, it's nowhere near as big a deal, of course, as the uh, as the uh, merger between AT and T and T Mobile, which the FCC and the Department of Justice uh, uh, squashed last year. Uh, but it's an important deal, and I think uh, it underscores a couple of things that we've been talking about in the past. One of which is that you know we have what uh, even the FCC calls a spectrum crisis. Mobile networks are are uh, already overtaxed, and as people. You know, make more use of their smartphones and other mobile devices. Um, the 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 stress and strain on the mobile infrastructure is just going to get stronger. Uh, the FCC says we need to bring 300 megahertz more spectrum online for mobile broadband users, uh, and that by 2015, because the clock is already ticking on this. But they don't seem to have any uh, way of doing so. When uh, they ask the government to give up some of their spectrum, the government says no. When the parties try to use mergers to do it, the FCC says no. Uh, when uh, you know other kinds of deals are are being talked about, uh, the you know, the FCC uh, says no again. So it's 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 clear that we have a problem, but but no one seems to be able to come up with a solution that satisfies the FCC. Uh, they're kind of pinning all their hopes on these incentive auctions where TV broadcasters will be asked to give up some of the spectrum that they've got that they're not necessarily using. But even if that works, it's going to be at least 10 years before that new spectrum comes online for mobile broadband. And if the FCC is right, and I think they are, about the, uh, the, the sort of, you know, the crunch that we're facing, uh, we may hit a very hard stop on our mobile revolution long before those auctions can take place. Right, and we just had a report from the National Tele- Telecommunications and Information Association, the NTIA, on on the near impossibility of clearing more federal spectrum for auction. Why is that, Larry? Why why is it so impossible? <laughs> well, because they don't have any reason to want to do it. Uh, the government <laughs> was given this spectrum decades ago in the sort of uh, period when the FCC just gave spectrum away based on thinking, you know, something would be a good application. It would be in the "Quote unquote public interest and both to private and to public entities, uh, Spectrum was just kind of doled out on the theory that they'd never run out uh, in the early days of, uh, of radio communications. That might have seemed reasonable, but long ago we realized this was not a good approach to dealing with a limited resource. So we've got government agencies and, of course, the Department of Justice through the FBI and the Department of Defense are two of the biggest holders, but every agency uh, has, uh, has some Spectrum. Uh, much of it's warehoused. The parts that are being used are used with the incredible inefficiency. A lot of it is for applications that could just as easily run on public networks without any real you know, risk to national security. But the agencies don't have any particular reason to cooperate. Uh, NTIA uh, doesn't have any power to force them to, to, uh, to make better use of their spectrum. They're only there to kind of coordinate government spectrum uses. So when the NTIA says uh, to these agencies, in particular to the DOD and the DOJ, uh, hey, we're in a crunch here. Can you give up uh, 100 megahertz that you're not really using? Uh, Why would any agency do anything but say, oh, no, we're using it. Uh, We can't give it up. Or if we gave it up, it would cost billions of dollars to relocate us, which, which is more money than you'd actually get from auctioning it. 
uh, or, you know, it's all national defense. Everything we're doing is in the interest of national defense. Uh, that's what happens when you give people stuff and don't put any, uh, any uh, restrictions on it. Uh, they have no reason to give it back uh, if uh, they think they can hold out and, uh, you know, get more money for it later. All right, so we can't get it from the government. The parties here are trying to uh, purchase it, Verizon. Um, why, Jeff, is it uh, a recipe for certain mischief, uh, in your words, for the FCC to scrutinize this? Uh, th those may have been my words, but you know the reason Larry likes my filing so much is because I cite him 47 times in it. So <laughs> I'm sure I actually just paraphrased that from Larry. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> uh, well, okay, so I, I guess um, you, you, the way you phrase the question um, goes to the, the first answer, which is um, uh, they can't get it from, from the government. Uh, apparently, they can't merge to, uh, to, to, to get it. Um, AT&T was able to buy some Spectrum from, from Qualcomm. It's hard not to see that as a sort of concession prize, given the, uh, what happened in the merger, and I'm not sure that it would have been so... Um, so quick to have been approved if the merger hadn't been pending at the same time. Um, and now it turns out that uh, it could potentially be um, you know, hard uh, in other circumstances to purchase the spectrum from other private holders. Well, you know, the, the implication behind those who really want the FCC to intervene here is that they know what the market should look like. They know that it should be lots of smaller competitors, that there's this great danger to all of us from having uh, Verizon and AT&T owning uh, apparently more than, you know, 30% each or 20% each of the available spectrum. Uh, and, um, and they want to stop this um, uh, because they think that there's some theoretical alternative purchaser out there who, who could use it, um, who, who could use the spectrum. And their main criteria is just that they're not Verizon or AT&T. And the problem is that um, in the short run, stopping this purchase does one thing. It leaves the spectrum in the hands of a bunch of companies that are emphatically not using it. Um, so it takes it out of the hands of a company that has demonstrated pretty extensively that it has a strong interest and ability to roll out spectrum. And it leaves it with a bunch of companies that do not have that ability or that interest. Um, so in the very short run, that strikes me as, as um, uh, antithetical to... to what they should be looking for. But in the long run, I think the idea that we should be favoring smaller companies and disfavoring large companies from owning and deploying Spectrum here, uh, you know, smacks of, um, of industrial engineering by, by the government. I don't think there's any evidence that really supports that. In fact, there's a lot of contrary evidence. There's a great chart I, I put in my filing um, that compares con basically concentration of... Uh, um, market share, I don't think it's spectrum per se, I think it's market share, um, to, um, uh, uh, yeah, measured by HHIs, to um, uh, wireless prices. And I can't remember now if it's for data and voice or just data. Um, and there's an inverse relationship. Increasing concentration seems to be correlated with decreasing price. Um, and, uh, and there's a lot of reasons to think that relatively large uh, fairly concentrated uh, companies um, are, are the most efficient outcome here. Um, there's a lot of theory behind that. that we have a lot of uh, many years of practice to suggest that that's probably true. And uh, so those who, who have a vision for, for what this industry should look like and want the FCC to implement their vision, and frankly, the FCC seems to have this vision, as they indicated in, the, um, in their um, staff report on the AT&T T-Mobile merger, um, you know, this this is um, it's it's not it doesn't seem to be justified by any of the available evidence, and it's um, it's just a terribly uh, a problematic way for a, a good modern capitalist economy to 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 exist. Right, I, I would your, hate to think. Your big point here seems to be that if the if the big issue is the FCC is concerned about the degree of competition involved in the deal, that that's, that's more a question for the DOJ and shouldn't be scrutinized by the FCC. That if they have antitrust concerns, they should come right out and let that be right. what's, what's at stake here. This, so this, we'll this see. Big, oh, sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. I, just, I mean, I'll just say really quickly that it, it um, there, there is a, 
uh, not that anyone's going to really do anything about this in the short run, but there is a there is a good reason for just the, what you described to to find it problematic that the FCC. Um, has this authority to essentially enforce the antitrust laws under, by the way, a, a much more lax standard than the antitrust agencies do, and right. um, and that that creates problems in all kinds of areas, um, but but particularly here where the DOJ is looking at this case, looking at different aspects of this case, and all the FCC is supposed to be doing, and I think all they're allowed to do under the statute is um, look at whether there are, there are the transfer of of licenses is in the public interest um and in this case anyway the transfer of licenses it doesn't inherently entail any anything that would be a, a an antitrust relevant concern i think so all right well thank you so much guys for all of your input on these great stories we have a, resor- a resource and a tip of the week to give our viewers and listeners the tip is that if you are in one of the 33 united states that has some form of electronic voting machine in place, you need to be a bit concerned because apparently these things are just not ready for prime time as security experts have been warning all along. Uh, There was a pretty interesting experiment conducted uh, by the Washington DC election board. Um, It uh, opened up some voting machines it was planning to use uh, to test them. It it invited the security community and members of the public to hack the machines um, and they were quite successful hacked. Uh, There was um, a group of two graduate students um, who got right on in, uh, figured out, you know, did a number of exploits. Um, One of them wasn't very difficult. They figured out that the passwords to get in were both, uh, the username and password were both admin. Um, And once they were in, they did all kinds (laughs) of fun things, including uh, electing Bender uh, as the uh, head of the school board in Washington, D.C. So um, if you're thinking that uh, there's a lot of reliability here, there still isn't. Uh, Is that you, Larry? Do you have a comment? Oh, no, I was just being cheeky. I, I I said electing Bender would probably improve things. Yes, exactly. Bender on the school board always seems like a good idea to me. Um, And then finally, our resource of the week is something uh, specifically for folks in New York, but also for anyone else uh, to use this as a jumping off point. Uh, Maybe they're at Lewis and Clark, Jeff, uh, Hmm. at the Brooklyn Law Incubator and Paul, I'm sorry, at Brooklyn Law School, there is an organization called BLIP, which is the Brooklyn Law Incubator and Policy Clinic. Uh, and they're having a legal hackathon coming up on uh, April 15th. That's going to be at noon on April 15th. I'm sorry, starting at 9 on April 15th at the Brooklyn Law School. Um, they're going to have all kinds of workshops, including a Hack the Act event where they're going to take SOPA and PIPA and all the controversy around it and get a bunch of smart people in one room and try and come up with alternative solutions that would work better and serve the interests of all the parties uh, who were on both sides of SOPA and PIPA. So uh, I really like to see this kind of effort underway and hats off to the BLIP, Brooklyn Law Incubator and Policy Clinic, for having a legal hackathon. I think it's a great idea and uh, we wish you good luck with it. So guys, this has been really fun and interesting and so informative. Thank you so much, Larry Downs, for joining us once again on This Week in Law. Uh, Anytime, please have me back soon. I I hope Hmm. you will come back soon. It's always great to have you. Uh, Jeff, you've been a great first-time panelist. It's it's so interesting to get your perspective. And uh, obviously, we just scratched the surface of some of these things. But we appreciate all your good work and uh, the work of your institute. Thanks so much. I really appreciate it. It was fun. And uh, always look forward to debating patents with Larry. (laughs) <laughs> it's always a good time. All right, guys. So uh, with that, we'll go ahead and sign off. In the meantime, of course, when you're not watching us live, you can get us um, over at twit.tv slash twill on iTunes and all the various ways that uh, you like to consume con- podcast content. Uh, and of course, hit us up between the shows uh, at our Facebook and Google Plus page, or you can reach me. I'm on Twitter at dhowell. 
uh, or email me, Denise at twit.tv. We appreciate all your input and suggestions for making this weekend law something you want to come back to time and time again, like we do. And we'll see you next week on This Week in Law.